All right, uh, I guess we might as well get started. Uh, welcome to the key things. Uh, this is the March Air Force Base Aero Club, uh, and I'm the safety officer for the Aero Club, and uh, Bob Pierce over there sitting in the corner is uh, the Aero Club manager. And uh, and we got our instructors some all throughout here, all over the place. Uh, I don't even see them right now. Uh, but anyhow, uh, welcome to the meeting. And uh, I would like to find out how many here who are not members of the club but are here because of the Wings program. Okay. All right. Welcome to the club here. Uh, I don't know if some of you, there was a little bit of confusion. Some people, uh, there is a caveat on the thing saying that, you know, unless you have a military ID or some way to get on the base, you know, it's going to be hard to get on the base. Uh, that's something that uh, is unfortunate for us here uh, in terms of people coming in on base. We even have that problem for our people who are members of the club who are in the Civil Air Patrol. Uh, because they're straight civilian, and sometimes the gate causes problems just having them come onto the base, too. So, you know, don't feel alone. Uh, but uh, the Aero Club is, uh, we hold these meetings once a month, and uh, most of our meetings are part of the WINGS program also, and uh, not all of them, because there are some that just pertain directly only for the club. But uh, uh, you're perfectly welcome to come, but you need to get a hold of me further in advance so that we can kind of make, have somebody up there be kind of an escort to bring people in. Uh, today we have people in here who could do that, and you guys got on, and, and I don't know how, you know, if you guys came in with the same thing or not. Um, but welcome, and uh, I hope I don't disappoint you with the meeting. Uh, especially since I got the FAA sitting over there watching me, so I got to be perfect tonight. So, uh, so uh, the uh, the rest of you guys here in the Aero Club, how many of you are registered in the Wings program? I've asked you this before, but I know it's increased since be I've seen it before. Yeah, and I and a lot of you have registered, pre-registered for the class, and I'm glad you guys did because. It makes my job a whole lot easier because uh, if I have to go by that second list where everybody writes their name in, it takes me a long time to try to get give you guys credit. So uh, if you've never had, if you don't aren't part of the Wings program, you can still sign that. And if you want to be part of it, then you have initial the last block on the far right hand side. And what that does is that tells me you want to be part of the WINGS program and you want me to put you in for the credit. Now you'll still need to register for that program on the FAA site, uh, but you will get credit for this uh, meeting and any other meetings that we have a WINGS program for. So if you haven't, you know, been part of it or for some reason you didn't register, then, you know, you, you can still do it. Uh, I still give you the credit. FAA holds on to it until you actually yourself go in and join the Wayne's program, and uh, then boom, you automatically get credit for this. So, any questions? Did you say that we can go on in advance and, and register for this, yes. this meeting, and then you don't have to do it for us? Well, I do it for I but what it does is, see, after the meeting, I tomorrow I'll go in there and go behind the computer, and then I, I <coughs> look at the meeting, and what it does is that those are pre-registered. All I have to do is just put a little check mark right next to the name. Uh, but if you haven't pre-registered, then I have to I have to put in your email, and and put it in that way, the long way, in other words. So. <coughs> Okay. All right. Um, we usually have uh, a little bit of a procedure that we do here. And now that we got the camera in here, uh, the cameraman was going to be a little bit late tonight, and so that's why we're a little bit behind time. Um, we do what we do is we go we go up here and we introduce new people. Along with this, what I do is that, along with new people, I also 
have anybody that wants to stand up and say anything, and that's all part of this introduction part of it. Uh, the first thing we have here, let's see, sir, did you want to talk yes, to? Yes, sir. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, if, you want, if you want to stand up and introduce yourself. Okay. Not a problem. How's everybody doing tonight? My name is James Vass. Um, I work at Airfield Operations. I'm the uh, contracting officer representative for base operations or airfield management and transient alert. The reason I'm talking to you tonight, I have two reasons. One, I'd like to ask information of you. Are you getting good service from airfield management? Are they when you call up and say, hey, where's my flight plan? Do they have your flight plan? Okay, these are the kind of things I need to know because if you're not getting good service, I'll talk to the airfield manager and we'll get you good service, okay? All right, the second thing is that I wanna ask you folks, when you fly, please make sure your clearing official signs the flight plan. We at Base Ops, which I'm former Base Ops, so I know the game, we will not call your flight plan around. We will not do anything if it is not signed, okay? So what was said earlier about clearing officials is serious. Number two, I remember years ago, we would have a certain individual whose name I still remember from 1988. He would fly, go get a hamburger, Next thing you know, we're doing a QALQ. Do we know what that is? No. For us, that means we're searching. We got a search for you. Reason? He's enjoying his burger, and today is National Cheeseburger Day. Did you know that? Yes. <laughs> yes. It's Air Force birthday. He, he's Air Force birthday too. 71st birthday, that's right. So, he's enjoying his cheeseburger, his fries, his strawberry shake, or whatever it was, and what didn't he do? Close That's it. Please close your flight plan, folks. Don't forget. Because what could happen, we're not going to talk about the nasty stuff. We'll talk about finances. What could happen is, if the FAA decides to start looking for you, and they find you, guess who pays the bill? Not us. You. Okay? So those are the only two things I got. Why did I end on a downer? Man, why did I do that? Anyway, enjoy your cheeseburgers or whatever you're going to do today. Here's my card. If you want one, come see Bob. If you have a problem with a flight plan, a problem with a person, a problem with me, call me. Okay? Yes, sir. If you're going to you're flying a local, you know, you can fill out flights at the local. You don't file that in the system, right? No. So if we go, go through the local... It's all VFR. Okay, if we're going to go local, we decide we're going to land for a hamburger, should we call base ops and say, close me out of here? Well, if you go over your allotted time on your flight plan, of course. Yeah. yeah, but other than that... But really, once you land somewhere, you should let us know. Do yes, you know sir. when base ops is going to get their facts uh, fixed? We've been having a problem since last Friday, uh, not being able to fax in flight plans, and then we had to go to weather, but then over the weekend, weather's fax went down for a toner cartridge of all things, and now we had to drive all the way to base ops, which you know, in itself isn't fun. But when you're doing multiple flights all day long for, a, could get for four a days, you know, you get yeah. tired driving back and forth, and we had to basically stop training for a fax. Believe me, I understand. How many of us were military, former military, in the military right now? What time of year is this? End of the fiscal year. Guess what? We need money. So that's why it's not fixed right now. The problem we're having is, you know, ultimately, the, the third way for us to get the fax to you is to email it. But the problem is the server strips our uh, attachments because we're using civilian email because mm -hmm. we don't have a CAT card. Right. And so, you know, trying to email it to you most of the time is not really a viable option. I understand. Let me take that back to my shop. Uh, we'll talk about it, see what we can do as a workaround. Uh, but for now, um, the driving thing is all I can give you. Again, my card is up here. Please take one, give me a call, email me, whatever you need to do to let me know what your concerns are. Anyone else? 
All right. You guys are so wonderful and so easy. And have a good night. Thank you. We've well, got you fools. <laughs> <laughs> and, and for you guys who are not part of the Aero Club, that, uh, that up to 8 and, you know, where you don't close your flight plan, that pertains to you guys, too. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. That's all part of <laughs> Okay. Now, let's see. Dr. Foster, did you want to say anything? Here we go. <laughs> As the magazine's over here, you get to take two of them to say anything. <laughs> uh, uh, CFIs, can I see your hands please, CFIs. Okay, for you guys, I know this is going to be a short notice for you, but Thursday is a CFI DPE open forum, Riverside. If you could, go on FASH.gov, register. Uh, if you can't get in there, you know, come on and show up. But here's the problem, depending on how many people register, we'll determine if I'm going to put it in the conference room, which only holds 18 people, or if I do it in the lobby, which holds up to 250 people. Take your pick. Register. Thank you. Thank you. He's here too in the middle of check writer. And Bob too. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, new people. I know we've had people join the club recently, uh, but I can't tell where you are. Okay, stand up, introduce yourself, give us a short speech for about two minutes. No, not really. <laughs> uh, I'm Stephen Chaco. Um, I just joined the Aero Club like two or three weeks ago. Um, I work over here at, uh, across the street. Uh, I'm a 2T2 at the 56th Air Force Squadron. Um, I'm a reservist, um, and I'm going to school right now. I'm about to go to Emory Riddle. Okay. Welcome to the club. Anybody else? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, first is Sean Rogo. Uh, I got my pilot's license here about five years ago, almost five years ago, and I'm in pilot training. Um, so now I'm flying with the uh, 236 Influence Squadron. On case 135, the OP representative from the two year club. So, uh, if you have any questions, let's see. All right. Okay. Um, I think that's it. I got these glasses too. Okay. All right. New pilot ratings. Yep. Okay. Sophie. Yay, Sophie. Sophie, stand up. Where's Sophie? Yeah. Oh, she's right there. There she is. Sophie got her pilot's license last Friday. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. She was nervous about it. <laughs> but look at the smile today. <laughs> yes. We can celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> I'll ask Pam later. <laughs> when are you taking my plane? Yeah. Um, whenever Jerry puts me in the computer. <laughs> uh, Sophie really worked hard on it for this. And we had uh, two people this week that have passed their writtens. Okay. Mr. Paul Witt, Chief Master Sergeant Paul Witt, and uh, Master Sergeant Terry Musburger. Oh, Congratulations. That's, uh, that's not a lot of fun. Well, it can be fun if you want it to be. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? Has anybody had the ratings taken away? Right? <laughs> <laughs> Close, but no cigar. Right? Um, yeah, mine will probably be taken away next week. Yeah. <coughs> Why don't you, uh, did you want to say anything about your... Yeah, just for everybody to know, uh, next week I'll be in Oklahoma City. I'll uh, be uh, taking the DPE uh, uh, course. Uh, tentatively, it'll be assigned to, uh, looks like Van Nuys uh, FISDO now. I was uh, supposed to be in Fresno, but now Van Nuys has called me and said they can get their paperwork in faster than Fresno can. <laughs> so, we'll see. So, we will have our own examiner here. Of course, those guys can't happen as an instructor, you can't examine them. <laughs> so, anyhow, um, 
let's see, right now, let's see, Jason, are, are you back from Korea? As of 22 hours ago, yeah. Okay. You got some guys that want to ask you some questions about ground school. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Experiences. This is just kind of a thing where we talk about uh, experiences that you've gone through in flying. And it doesn't have to be just Aero Club. It can be uh, Air Force guides who fly. I think um, Terry should probably brief his engine. I'm, well, yeah, we're going to do that in a couple of minutes. I'm going to hold Terry until we get started on the on the meeting on, on emergency. Uh, I already warned him, so he should be ready. Uh, so, anybody? Nothing? Nothing's exciting or anything? I did. Okay. Hey, Roger. Yeah. Hi, everybody. I'm Greg. I haven't been around for a while. So, I actually got my commercial license in Oklahoma uh, a few weeks ago. And, uh, yeah. The uh, experience, uh, I got to do the altitude chamber at the FAA Center in Oklahoma City, which is pretty cool. And uh, it's very poignant and frightening. Uh, it's it's on this. It's pretty dangerous. So, I just to say, definitely don't. So, Go past the hypoxia release. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, he's uh, he works. I mean, he does things with NASA, and he's part of some of the uh, stuff that they're doing the research on going to Mars. And uh, watch out for him, though. He's a psychologist, so uh, he might be analyzing you while he's. To ask him a question. Yeah. What altitude did you really start to feel it? I generally don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, down. We bounced up to probably 35,000 feet, and it was the whole thing is such a blur. I, like it really screws you up. Um, I, I don't remember the details. I remember just being like wondering why my hand is so tingly, and how we were supposed to, you know, write our names and do these little cognitive tasks on pieces of paper, and. I looked at it later, and it's just a bunch of scribble. It, it, like I don't actually remember the, the altitude, but they, they bumped us to 18 and then 35, um, and the details because we were on and off. I, I truly don't remember, but um, that and the night vision that we kind of looked at it at the same time, it lights out. It was very cool, very poignant education. Worth worth mentioning is that hypoxia affects everyone differently. His his tingling hands may have been an indication that he was beginning to um, um, his his blood alcohol oxygen excuse me blood alcohol. <laughs> 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 that, that was a fact that you know, uh, saturation <laughs> was different. In my scenario, my yeah. lips were tingling. So, oh, so yeah. everybody's a little bit different. So Mine was really. just I, I felt dizzy. That, that, that was my yeah. 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 And uh, first time us in the Air Force go up now to chance forty five thousand. That's what I love. And wow, <laughs> you know it's it's something we had Shepherd Air Force Base. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's interesting. It's fascinating. If you ever get the chance to go up an altitude chamber, for those of you that have been in the Air Force and done it, do it. I tell you, it's, it's, it's worth at least doing it one time. It's, it's really is neat. You find out a lot of things about yourself, <laughs> especially when you take the mask off and you start doing weird things. Um, okay, Bob's going to talk to us, and then we're going to go into emergencies and the PIC, um, and uh, we'll get going with Bob. Don't take up too much time. I know, we're running out of time, so i got to make it real quick. It's great to see a lot of people at our meeting here. It seems like every time we have this once a month, we get a few more bodies, and I appreciate you all showing up. So I have a few things here. Credit card slips for those, remember, on top of the little box that you put the numbers in for the cost, be sure and write the invoice number on that. Otherwise, it takes time for us to research where we're going here, and then we can match then the credit card slip to the invoice. Aircraft, let's try and wipe down the sides when we fly the aircraft. We had a discussion here earlier. I realize that you know we need to take and send them out to the wash rack. So if you're interested in washing one of our airplanes, we give you 30, 30 minutes of free time. You can go down to uh, French Valley. We give you the bucket, we give you the soap, and uh, the scrub brush. Uh, we give you a couple of towels to wipe down the windscreens. 
and the windows and bring it back and it gives you a half hour of flight down and, and uh, a few minutes extra and then you pay for the difference. And it's a lot of fun to try and do that. Uh, we are investigating shoulder harnesses for the T30, uh, T41 Alphas. Um, we're not sure what modification STC we're going to be able to use, but we're going to try and do that. Let me just cover a couple of programs to, uh, real quick like for the Aero Club and, and new things that are taking place in regards to this. Right now, every quarter, we're going to have a, a conference call and we're going to discuss between the Aero Clubs the pros and cons they've been in, uh, involved with, some of the things that may help us, what we may help us in another Aero Club to make things smooth. We're trying to look at standardization for all of the instructors. And we're looking at standardization for all the aircraft. We're not trying to have a bunch of different things. In regards to that, we're trying to get funding now to replace all the old aircraft. So my job this between now and the middle of the October, when I submit the form back to headquarters, which is in San Antonio to Stacy, is that we're going to be putting in our aircraft information the total airframe time. Some of these things are in 8, 10, 10,000 hours or more. Uh, it doesn't mean I'm going to get rid of the T-34s. Uh, I'm trying to get either Cessnas or Pipers. They're in the process now to see what kind of a contract they can get, and it'll be a 172 for more than likely. So that looks good for the future for, for all of the aero clubs to getting new aircraft. That's going to bring more people in. In the meantime, we may try and keep a couple spares or maybe at least one spare so we can have three. Right now we need three, and it's causing us a problem, especially with aircraft sitting in Hemet uh, requiring an engine change. And that's another process that's already taken me two weeks to get this far with my three bids, and I'm probably going to stick with the two. Uh, the third one I'm still waiting for and submit that on an out of, out of cycle and ask for $30,000 for an engine. And we'll ship the block that we have in the, in the hangar to Colorado Springs to Sky, uh, Western Skyways uh, for an overhaul. Uh, versus going to Tim's aircraft or to one stop. Right now their prices are up a little bit higher than, than uh, what we're requiring. And we've set out a, a statement as to what we're looking at. So new cylinders, pistons, rings, go through the bottom end and a test run and overhaul the carburetor, the alternators, new, new magnetos, I should say, new alternator, new pumps, and etc. So we'll have a brand new engine for uh, 290 Foxtrot. Um, the Aero Club manager is also looking at a Rusty Pilots review program, whereby individuals who come in, they haven't flown in 10, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, uh, su supplying an X amount of dollars for that Rusty program for the individual to come back up to speed and join the Aero Club. We're not sure where that's going to go as far as requirements. Uh, that's still in the mill and it's been in a deep discussion, but a lot of good things uh, coming in. Check rides on an average throughout the aero clubs are about two weeks on an average. Some are up to four weeks in regards to that. Uh, they're looking at replacing the flight training program. That's kind of old and obsolete. It's over 20 years old, and we've asked for funds uh, about six years ago for another 125000 for a new program. And then all of a sudden they said we don't have the money from services. So there's a lot going on right now, a lot of discussion, and a different viewpoint of what's taking place with the aero clubs, what they can do. Does everybody understand by 1930, uh, excuse me, 2039, the FAA is looking for four, 725,000 pilots requirements. Right now it's 625 for about 2025. So there's a big need for pilots, both in the services and on the outside. And what they're trying to do now is feed uh, the UAV programs. And by doing this, we're going to be training more pilots. Most of the people that we have here in the guard, they're looking at, at getting that uh, program into their into the system here. So, if you have any questions, you can speak to me afterwards. Um, we're also looking at uh, safety. Just be aware, uh, the Aero Club has gone through a number of engine failures here in the last few months. And according to uh, uh, Colonel Schumann here, in the last uh, week and a half, two weeks, we've had three engine failures just in the Riverside area. So something is going on, we don't know what. It takes a lot of research to try and figure out whether it's starvation or whether it's a failure of a part or something. And we're gonna have uh, uh, Mr. Mossberger come up here and, and talk about his episode and I'll add some stuff to that. So take the thunder away. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's it. Okay, any questions? I mean know where that's at. 
Sacramento. Yeah, right. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. In fight emergencies. You know what? It won't happen. Uh, yeah, it won't happen to me. Uh, you may be wondering why I'm talking about this tonight. Well, uh, guess what? It did happen to me. Not to me, but it did happen to one of our neighbors. And Bob already let the cat out of the bag. Um, Terry, did you want to come up now and talk about it? Come up here. See, anytime you have that major of a thing take place. We're on the subject tonight. You may be asking when Bob said we got an airplane in Emmett that's broke and we have to have an engine change. Well, this guy right here broke it. He broke, broke it. it. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody point their fingers at Terry. Uh, it was sold. I thought you guys wanted a new one. Yeah. So. See, well, that's. <laughs> uh, now, Terry, just kind of give an idea of just what happened, you know. When, you know uh, just a real quick synopsis and, uh, and uh, just what all took place. Okay, so I was on my third solo and it was uh, my first area solo um, to where I was going out from here doing some area work and going over to Hammett, do a couple of pattern works there, uh, turn around and go back to March. Did the area work, everything was fine, went over to Hammett, everything was fine. Um, that's right when the Corona fire happened. So, uh, Hemet, as everyone knows, has all the tankers that are kind of taken off. And me being there was kind of clogging up the runway, so I made the decision to start heading back to March, kind of get out of their way so they could do their thing. Um, so, I was on the ground when I made that decision. Uh, took off. As soon as I took off, I was coming up maybe about 400, 500 feet. Um, I was starting my turn towards the north. I was coordinating with a tanker behind me to kind of overtake me on the left-hand side so they could go out and fight the fire. Uh, heard a loud bang um, in the cockpit. It's followed by a vibration. So as soon as that happened, I made the decision to immediately turn back to Hemet. Um, so kind of coordinated with the guy that was overtaking me. Um, entered into the, um, obviously, crosswind, downwind, everything like that. As I was doing that, I was AB aviating, navigating, kind of forgot to communicate with everyone else around me what was going on, uh, which precluded me from um, declaring an emergency with everyone else. Probably should have done that in hindsight, just because a lot more options would have opened up for me. They would have given me a lot more space and everything like that. I didn't do that. Um, so, came in. Um, as I turned base, I really wanted to go on the ground, so I actually turned base late way too early, which caused me to do a go-round, um, because I wouldn't have been able to make the runway. So as I went around, the second time I came back in, I gave myself enough room. As I turned final, the uh, engine shut off on me. So kind of, it's like, all right, well, taking it in. So <laughs> made the runway maybe by like a couple feet. Um, and just coasted it on the runway. Uh, pulled off onto the side, off the runway, so I didn't clog up, clog everything up so the tankers could still take off and go. Got out, walked out, but if you can't pick me up, and I threw that point back. So, um, I think what ended up happening, we took apart the cowling. Uh, something with the head happened where a bolt sheared off, causing the piston head to uh, kind of depart a little bit. Oil was spinning out everywhere, and the vibration caused the air intake to pretty much it shook it off, which then caused the plane to choke out. So Just real quick, first I'd like to say, I. If you see the Forest Service guys, thank them. Because once he got on the ground, they came out and uh, make sure he was okay because they heard everything that was going on. Got the airplane clear of the uh, the runway in the infield and parked it, took the cow off, let, you know, see what was going on with that so that when he called back, he had the most up-to-date information he could give us on exactly what happened so that we could make the decisions here at the club on what we needed to do. So the Forest Service did a great job in helping us out, and putting the airplane out on the ramp and uh, and taking care of Terry until we could get out there and uh, get to him. Um, I think my favorite part of that story was there was a tanker that was just to be in the main. He saw me land, barely made the runway. He calls over the radio. He's like, geez, that's not like, kind of close. He's like, yeah, it's my third. Third solo, my engine just cut out on me on final. 
He's like, oh, knowing that, good job. <laughs> <laughs> what do I do now? Just pull it off. That's my story. cover a couple things here. The first indication we begin to have and, and maintenance started looking at the aircraft is that the we were producing oil in the nose strut and they washed down the engine and one of the things that came up is that it appeared that the crankcase had more oil than normal therefore it becomes blow by so it drained oil out of the crankcase. That was actually the next flight where the engine failed and this is what took place. It pulled two studs out of the block this happens to be America's engines again pull two studs out of the block, strip the bolts off the other so that the, the total cylinder separated off the block itself and the piston, when it became very violent, broke off the, the skirt. We're missing the skirt and we're missing the oil ring off that thing. The rod shows a bend and we have a crack in the, cr in the crank crankcase. Pardon me. It looks like around where the cylinder is bolted on. And when it failed, it's because the intake failed, opening up nothing but a suction of air. That's what saved the aircraft from really having catastrophic engine failure with the engine coming apart on the thing. So the engine quit because it didn't have any gas. It was sucking air. That's what took place. And the, the pictures are pretty interesting. So right now, Terry, uh, FAA's got it closed. It's, it's a closed deal. So that's where we are. Don't worry about it. It's been taken care of. Is there oil at all? Did yeah, get... the entire bottom of the oil. What about the windscreen? Uh, the windscreen now. Okay. It stayed pretty well contained inside the collie. Yeah. Good job, Terry. Uh, Terry is a boom operator <laughs> on a KC-135, so we already know how to fly. Uh, <laughs> so, so I figured... Uh, if there was anybody that was going to have that happen to the terror was the person to have it done. Um, I'm a proud I, papa. Yeah. I, I was going to show a video tonight, but I figured it, but he took care of that. So this is a whole lot more interesting about what we're talking about tonight. And basically this was this was the real thing. And uh, Emergencies are one of those kind of things. Let me just put the whole thing. Um, the emergencies are something that you know we're all very much aware of, and it's one of those kind of things where uh, if we um, you know you know think about it, usually you know we 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 think we can handle emergencies, and. Uh, one of the things that can happen is that you get out there and you have a real emergency and you always have this little thing about were you really prepared for that emergency and that's one of the things that an instructor is supposed to do along with your own flying is that when I started flying many, many years ago, and I will not tell you how long ago it was, uh, I didn't really think a lot about it a whole lot, about, especially with an engine loss. I mean, you know, it was, you hardly ever heard anything about it, and yet every once in a great while in the newspaper you read about it. But it wasn't until I started getting older and wiser, I guess you'd call it, uh, you start thinking a little bit more about an emergency in the airplane. And today, of course, you know, with the advent of the computers, we now hear about it a whole lot more. I'm sure that the emergencies were taking place back in the 40s and the 50s, probably even more, maybe in a lot of ways, because some of the older airplanes, the airplanes, as, as technology gets better, you know, I think that engine failure is, is on the low end, but it still happens. But it's, it's one of those things where when you take off, you've got to be thinking worst case scenario. And, well, gee, you're being a little negative. No, no, no. You're wanting to, to stay alive. And you've got to do that in aviation. Uh, 
we get in our cars and we take off down that freeway where everybody's driving 300 miles an hour, and uh, you know about that, but you figure, you know, on the freeway, you can kind of maybe, you know, you can maneuver to get yourself out of it. Uh, in an airplane, of course, just like we tell everybody, who, for all of us who fly, you know, that's the only way to go. You know, the first time you look down there at the freeway, after you start flying and see all that bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic, you know it was worth spending all that money to get your license. But you also know that when you're up there in the air, there's things that can happen where you can't just pull over. And you've got to do something about it. And uh, basically, one of the things that I find is that, um, you know, safety meetings are not to teach, but they are to make you aware of things and to help you get to that point of where whatever the safety briefing is on to make you more safe in terms of flying an airplane. Um, the instructors, of course, when they teach a student, the whole idea of teaching that student is so that not just only to learn how to fly an airplane, but to keep you from crashing an airplane. And it's basically, really, an instructor is a safety. He's teaching the safety of that airplane. And hopefully, all it's all integrated. And uh, one of the things that you should be learning is like, you know, avoiding emergencies. And one of the things is, is procedures, checklists, things like that. How many here from the Air Force are still are? I know, come on, you guys. I know all you guys have done. <laughs> I, you, you, you know, we know about checklists, right? And uh, this crowd here, I probably don't have to preach it at all. You know, checklist is, is a must, and it's one of those things that Air Force especially mandates. You, you got to have it. If you're in the Aero Club, you must have a checklist. Now, some of you guys on the outside, I don't, you know, you have your own self, uh, you know, how, where you put yourself. And I, I don't know if you use checklists or not. I, you know, maybe who you fly with, it makes you do that too. But the checklist is one of those items that kind of, it helps you avoid emergencies. In other words, basically, it helps you keep you from skipping that item in there that just might end up getting in trouble, like running out of gas, for instance. Um, attitude, that's another thing. Boy, I'm telling you, this one here I've seen uh, in the Air Force. You know, there's, there's a certain attitude that I can handle anything. And, and I've seen this happened to a couple of times when we had a, a 141 uh, scrape the runway because they forgot to put the gear down. And what was really interesting about it is the whole cockpit was had examiners in it when this happened. And uh, now it found out later on, and again, there was an attitude problem there. The flight engineer knew that the gear wasn't down, but because he got into some kind of an argument with the pilots, he deliberately on purpose didn't say it. Wow. Yeah, that, that was a number of years ago. And I'm telling you, but, you know, this, this, you know, you, 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 <laughs> when you're flying an airplane, I know it's easier said than done, but attitude needs to leave, be out back there in the land. Uh, or you don't fly. And of course we all know about, about you know, I'm safe, uh, vernacularism where you talk about, you know, did you just have an argument with your wife or your husband? Did you, uh, yeah, even new husbands, uh, <laughs> you know, we just got married. Um, or, you know, there, if you think that you can't concentrate on flying that airplane, then you better not fly. 
uh, David, our mechanic over there, you know, he's concerned about the fact he's so busy trying to fix our airplanes, he hardly ever gets to fly as a pilot. And, you know, he told me this morning he's concerned about it. He really is. He doesn't fly. You know, he lets his brother fly it, and his brother gets to fly all the time. You know, but David sits over there, and, he, you know, he, he deliberately keeps away from doing that because he knows he's not proficient. And uh, so that's one of those things you got to watch out for. Um, techniques. Um, Air Force doesn't like teaching techniques, but you do have techniques. And there's things that you do that can get you in trouble, and believe me, that's why you have a buying your flight review to do those. Or if you're working for a company that does check rates like an airline, or here in the Aero Club, we have, have an annual check every single year here just like the Air Force does. We fall into the same regulation that the C-17s and the F-16s do. Um, we have to have a check every year. Um, they're watching for those techniques. Are you doing a technique that's going to get you in trouble? Uh, and uh, let me see, let me go in here. Uh, what happens in emergencies is determined before the event occurs. Air Force does a lot of um, simulator stuff, and uh, there's a reason for that. And they all they set you up so that when you get into your airplane and you get into an emergency, you probably have seen that emergency before, and it's probably not your first time. Now, on the outside, it's a little bit different. The buy-in and flight review doesn't cover necessarily the emergencies. The instructor may put you in a situation where you just lost your engine, but it doesn't necessarily cover any, all, and everything that could take place with an airplane. So that's one of those things that you really have to pay attention to. I, I don't know, maybe I overpreach it, but I always say if you get Microsoft Flight Sim or X-Plane, use it. And you can set those things up to have something fail on the airplane. And you can set it up so that it, you don't know when it's going to happen. And I, 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 you know, I say it over and over again, and, you know, even myself, I'm just as much to blame. I don't use it enough <laughs> like I should. But, you know, when you sit there and fly these airplanes, you know, anything can happen. That's Terry, you know. Uh, it's one of those things that I think that you need to keep focused on the fact that anything could happen. Go over the emergency checklist. You know, every once in a while, pull, pick that thing up, look and see what it is that you're supposed to be doing. Even if you sit in your own airplane and the cockpit is just to be utilized. You know where everything's at. Determine before the event occurs. That's basically what that is. You're, you're, you're setting it up. If you're taking off from Riverside Airport on uh, runway, what is it, 27? Yeah. You know, and the engine quits on the other end. Where are you going to go? What are you going to do? There is a golf, that golf course is still there, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a golf course there. We'll get into, I know some of you in the back of your mind you say, well, I'll try to turn it out back. Well, um, we can, we'll look at that in a second. Uh, how much time I got left? Three hours? Good. Okay. Uh, pilot responsibility authority. The pilot is directly responsible uh, for his final, he is the final authority as to the operation of the aircraft. In an emergency, you can deviate from any rules in 14 CFR Part 91, Subpart A, and Subpart B. I actually opened up the, the book and actually read those things. <laughs> because it's been a while since I looked at um, So you can do that. And FAA has given you a, a way out of being able to control that airplane and get the thing down. Um, 
What is an emergency? Well, FAR 91.3. Uh, this, this is just a thing. This is just telling us what we're doing. Um, you can declare an emergency, but just because you declare an emergency doesn't mean that you're in a distressful situation. Uh, you don't have to be. Um, you can, you know, how many of you here have gone out and, and gotten lost? and needed help. I know it does happen. I know everybody here is, never gets lost, but uh, it, does, it has happened. <laughs> and um, it's one of those things where you can call, and it's not, a, it's not an emergency or anything, but you just, you know, you call and find out, you know, I need some veteran or whatever. But when you get a problem that takes place in the airplane, that's something that you don't want to play around with. Um, you can declare an emergency and it not be something where you have to get the airplane down right now. You, you don't have to do that. Air Force, we used to declare emergencies every once in a while. And Air Force mandates and says if you shut an engine down, you got to do it. And, and I was in a four-engine jet, so, you know, we had three other air engines. <laughs> but we were supposed to declare emergency anyhow. Uh, now, if you start losing another engine, you know, then maybe, wow, you know, that could be come now, even in a four engine. Now, how many are from fighters? Well, yeah, I know <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> you flew eight tens, didn't you? You know, it's those things, you know, they, they drop like a rock. But a Cessna does not. And the airplanes that we fly here in the Aero Club, I don't know what you gentlemen fly, but uh, I know with our airplanes, you know, you got a pretty good glide. You know, you can get that airplane down pretty good. Um, however, The emergency can be either a distress or an urgency condition. What would you call an urgency condition? Your engine's running rough. Okay. You lose RPM. Okay. You lose your um, constant speed throttle or a uh, propeller starts to cycle a whole bunch. Over speed. Okay. <laughs> okay. You can actually be just low on gas. It's not an emergency yet, but it could be if you don't get on the ground too. You don't get on the ground. Maybe low fuel. Yeah. 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 Do not hesitate to declare an emergency. There, uh, there has been people I know that would not call it an emergency because they thought that they had to fill out FAA paperwork. <coughs> well, first off, yeah. ir irrespective of that, so what? even if you did, but, <laughs> you know, but end up crashing or something getting a lot worse because you didn't think that you want, or you didn't want to do that. So, I, you know, don't, don't sit there and think you, don't, don't sit there and think you can handle it either. Um, a distress is a condition of being threatened by serious or imminent danger and requiring immediate assistance. How about a fire? We do we do a meeting in here once in a while where we do uh, talk about that very subject. And uh, the Cessnas have a line that comes down from the tanks down to the engine and it goes right by the cockpit. Uh, the last time I did a meeting on an in-flight fire, the fire caught on fire up in the cockpit and was up right up front. And the pilot, and I think, yeah, it had a passenger, they took the airplane and literally just dropped it right out of the sky. They got the plane on the ground in an open field. And I don't remember how many seconds it was right now, but they got it on the field and they still ended up getting third-degree burns on the legs. 
and of course the plane burned up. Uh, in pipe fire, you don't even want to play around with that at all, obviously. And besides, you won't anyhow because you're going to be wanting to get that plane down. But there's a lot of other things. You know, what about a fuel leak? You know, you're getting a fuel leak and you're noticing that the gauge is kind of going like this. Uh, there's a lot of things that you, you know, that you want to watch out for. It's something that you don't want to mess around with. And then, of course, we just talked about urgency. Uh, that's a condition of being concerned about safety, and it requires a timely but not immediate assistance. Um, accident versus incident, uh, that, I kind of screwed that one in. Um, the uh, Terry's was more of an incident, because it was not an accident. He had no damage to the airplane, and anyway, obviously the engine, but, but he got the airplane down and everything was fine. An accident is when you, you know, gear comes up and everything else. But because it was an actual engine fare, but it was a reportable incident to the FAA. Yes. Because it was a... Because it was an engine failure on that. Now, now, you know, um, Dr. Foster can, uh, maybe he'll, he can jump on me on that, but a few years back, when they still had the physical offices where they were still, you could go in and <laughs> walk in, they used to have some safety meetings in there. And the former director of the physical office here in Riverside used to hold those meetings on, on, on all kinds of subjects. It was fascinating. I loved going to those things. But one of the things he talked about is he said, you know, there were a lot of times where, where people would lose an engine up around Victorville or up in the desert and land the thing and put fuel in the thing and take off and leave and then call them up and say, you know, I have an engine failure. And he said, I, he said, I used to be really upset because he says, why did you tell me that? <laughs> Because now I got to report it. I have to put a report in. But he said, "Did you ding an airplane? No. Did you, did you knock over? You know, did you destroy property? No. Well, then why did you even tell me about it? You know, <laughs> just take off and get out of it." <laughs> he he actually told us. This is the guy that was running the pistol. He says, "Don't tell me if you landed an airplane, especially if you ran out of gas." That's the most embarrassing of all. Man, man, you know, and just you know, put gas in and get out of there. <laughs> but don't tell me about it. <laughs> so, I, that's, that's something that, you know, there's times to fess up, there's times to not fess up. Um, this is the attitude problem. That's, that's what that is. Um, I've seen this before, so don't worry about it. Uh, some are reluctant to report an, uh, an urgency condition. Uh, usually, in something like that, people just basically, it's a pride thing more than anything. Uh, I've known pilots that just didn't want it. They, did, they never did anything wrong, so therefore, I don't report any of this stuff to anybody. Um, The key about emergencies is, uh, is safety. And there's lots and lots of help here in Southern California. Uh, if you get yourself uh, into a situation where you're, you know, like up in Idaho or someplace where there may not be as much traffic, you know, that's one thing. But down here in Southern California, you always got somebody that you can talk to on that radio. And, and, and believe it or not, ATC is not your enemy. They will, yeah, they gladly will help you. And especially if you get it to the point where it becomes an emergency. Be very careful about what you do. I mean, you know, don't just sit there and not say anything. Um, and of course, like it says down at the bottom of the paragraph, it, you know, don't delay. You know, it can cause accidents. And just like it says, safety is not a luxury, but you take action. Do it right now. Um, 
we got emergency safe available, like I just said, emergency equipped 18 seat facilities can provide you with radar assistance and navigation. And uh, can beckon you into places to get you out of a situation or get you someplace down a little quicker. Um, many pilots who are not instrument rated can find themselves flying into uh, you know, IFR situation. Um, if you're in an emergency and it forces you into something like that, you need to be talking to somebody. You need to be talking to um, ATC. Uh, if you're low on fuel and you know you're flying from here from Travis Air Force Base or something like that, and, you know you get a lot of fog. You get the Thule fog down in the valley and stuff. Those are things that you need to be aware of. And uh, you want to, you know, if you have a problem that comes up to you, you have to get the airplane down, then you need to be talking to ATC and finding out what your options are. Don't keep silent about it. Um, I'm trying to get so we're not. minutes after eight. No, I probably shouldn't so you guys uh, okay. Uh, transponder emergency spot load three A code seventy seven hundred emergency and load C pilots should understand they might not be within radar coverage and of course up where my hometown is that's exactly true. We do not have the radar coverage up where I'm from in Northern California at all until we get hit ten thousand feet. Um, continuous clocking code 7700 and establish radio, radio communications as soon as possible. Because you know, I know a lot of people fly out of this area. My Bob and I go to Texas every once in a while. We used to when we had the T-34s down there. And we used to go down there and fly across the country. Um, Just real quick, when I was flying for the Air Force, there was two situations where we were flying up to Alaska, and we were flying on the east coast, or east coast, on the east side of California, and we got this mayday across the radio, and uh, an airplane out of Reno lost its engine, and he was going down, and. Uh, we relayed that to uh, to ATC, and uh, we kept on the radio talking back and forth with this guy until he finally hit the ground. And uh, about the time he crashed, another airplane, because of we you know we were up up I think we were about thirty five thousand at that point, and there was several airplanes that started heading that direction, but one airplane finally was right, he saw, actually saw him hit the ground. And uh, they, of course, relayed to ATC, and uh, and uh, the good one guy got a broken leg, and I guess they survived the thing, and they were able to go in and get him right away. But military has done a lot of saving people's lives over the years. I mean, I... I, you'll read articles about it once in a while, and I've seen it happen for, with us, with me, on the airplane twice. And, uh, and of course, uh, Cliff was in the business, but <laughs> I'm doing that. But uh, um, the, there's always somebody out there that's willing to help. Commercial airliners. Um, I mean, there was a guy, and I don't remember or not, that was flying a, um, what was it, I think it was a 310, or it was a 210. No, it's Ray It was a multi-engine. And he died from a heart attack, and the wife was sitting there not knowing what to do. And uh, there was a couple of commercial airliner that that actually circled around a couple of times and helped her pilot the airplane until they could get where ATC got somebody in there who flew the same kind of airplane. They, she actually got the plane down and saved her. So it, it, they're out there. There's people out there who are willing to help. Uh, 
competency. But then, then there's communications. Uh, we got distress. Communications at absolute priority over everything. And the word mayday commands radio silence on the frequency. And that's basically what that's for. Uh, air emergency communications at priority or all other communications except for distress. The word pan pan warns other stations not to interfere with the urgency transmission. Also, too, the clip, you probably know that, is it pan pan international? Yeah, well, all of them are international, but pan pan is. Uh is another one that people use for for something that's not an actual you know emergency, but you know say like a hydraulics problem. Okay. They'll let them know they'll use pan pan. Yeah. Okay. Because I knew I had read that before at one time about that. Um, okay. Another thing that helps out: always keep your eye on the possible landing sites for airports when you're flying. Uh, this is one of those things where your instructor will sit there and when you go up with an instructor or your or your VFR or your annual check ride that we do here at Neural Club, you always know if the instructor is going to throw that on you. However, in real life, you know, you never know when that's going to happen. And one of the things that you want to do is that at least like the last paragraph I got down there is have some idea of the lay of the land. You know, I mean, you know, I know it would be really tiresome to kind of sit there and be constantly looking for a place to land, but when you use your charts or your, you know, uh, four flight or whatever it is you use, going from point A to point B, know just how the land is. If you're going over huge mountains and stuff, then you know the reality is, is that if you lose an engine or have any other problem with a fire or anything, that it's going to be a little bit harder for you to get that thing on the ground. Um, but if you're going all open country and you're going out across Texas or something, you know there's all kinds of places out there. The land. So know the lay of the land. And obviously when you have the emergency, of course, you'll end up, you know, okay, whoa, okay, I think I saw a field back over here or something like that. But don't fool around and get the airplane down. You know? Just remember, sometimes the landing area is behind you. Yes, that's right. And you were bringing that up to your students, yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, keep your eyes open. Uh, I know it's a lot of you, especially if you have autopilot like Bob's airplane does, you know, sit there and fall asleep and have to clean by yourself. Um, well, uh, I don't think he does that. But, uh, the Corsair airliners do. Right, John? What? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Only one pilot. Say again? <laughs> Say again? Yeah. Are we on yeah. the wrong frequency? You, that's right, you're on that airplane where they were playing games and they passed it. <laughs> Who was that? That wasn't American. That was Northwest. That was Northwest, yeah, where they did that. Okay, let me see if I can go through this if it works. Uh, let's see. Uh, emergency descents, uh, those are. These are done, that's the T-34 emergency descent for a forced landing right there. Uh, that's basically something that some of the POHs do have. Uh, and you might want to look at it, it kind of gives you an, all Air Force uh, tech manuals have these things that are 